I, I love it when a song leader gets enthusiastic about leading singing, and Steve and I talked about that. And when you get to a point, church is singing something, it's okay to sing that chorus again. Right, church? Amen. All right, there you go. Now, by the way, just so you'll know, I am thankful for Danny and Steve because I've got to tell you about this preacher and this song leader that just couldn't get along in church. They just had this bickering, and it really just got to a point where it was getting carried out in front of everybody. The, the preacher one Sunday was preaching about the importance of, of moving forward as a church, of setting goals, and of reaching toward those goals, and that it would require action on the part of the church. And so the song leader, right after the sermon, sang the song, I Shall Not Be Moved. The preacher talked about the next Sunday of the importance of giving, the importance of giving generously and sacrificially, and of how important it was that they were to meet these goals that it would require giving on the part of the church. And so the song leader led the song, Jesus Paid It All. The third Sunday, the preacher gets up and he's talking about gossip and of how talking about one another can be just, it, it's, in, it's bad for the church, it's not healthy for the church. These are stories that shouldn't be told among one another. And so the preacher gets up through, and the song leader gets up, and he leads the song, I Love to Tell the Story. So the fourth Sunday, the preacher gets up, he's had enough, and he says, Church, I want you to know that it looks like I'm going to resign, that I just feel like it's probably time to step down. Song leader gets up and he leads the song, Oh, Why Not Tonight? <laughs> and then finally, that fifth Sunday, the preacher gets up and he's preaching and he goes ahead and he resigns. And he says he felt like that it was something that Jesus had called him to do. And so the song leader gets up and he leads the song, I Have a Friend in Jesus. That's a tough deal, isn't it? And there are just sometimes, y'all, in all seriousness, in church, we have a hard time getting along. Can you take that idea and put it over here? Because we're going to come back to that in just a few minutes. I need to tell you about another friend that went out, and, and he was looking for a car. He was looking for a used automobile. And so he was looking in the paper and, and trying to find some various opportunities, and he never could find something quite like he wanted. But then he went to this one used car lot, and he finds this car, and he looks at it, and it looks great. And it's just what he's been looking for. And so he, he asks for the keys, salesman gives him the keys, he gets in the car, he cranks it, starts right up, and then he puts it in drive, and it immediately stalled. The guy's face just drops. The, the salesman looked at him and said, I, I don't understand why you... Why, why the look on your face? And he said, well, I, I like this car. I like the way it looks, but I cranked it and it didn't work. And the guy said, that's okay. We'll fix it. But we wait until the car is sold before we fix the problem. That doesn't sound right, Danny, does it? I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to buy that car. That there's something about when we're looking for an automobile, what is it we want? We want it to look good on the outside, but we need what's under that hood to work. I need it to do two things. I need it to start and I need it to stop. When people are looking today, remember this month we're looking at this series that's entitled Blueprint, God's Plan for the Church. But one of the things that really concerns me, and again, we'll get back to that first story in a minute, but one of the things that concerns me is that when people are looking for a place to worship today, it is like that old boy that went out looking for that car. And he looked at the car, and it looked good on the outside. And so he said, I'll take it. He said, I'll take it without ever looking underneath the hood. Do you understand what I'm saying? That he's sitting here and you look at the, what's on the outside, the appearance of the church, of what's flashy and what's all popular and what's trendy. But church, I have to tell you, there has to be something deeper than just what's appearance on the outside and what's apparent on the outside, what we can see and what we can view from the outside. There has to be something deep in what we have when we're looking for a church family that honors God and reflects Christ. 
And, and over the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about some of those key ingredients, that importance of Jesus being the chief cornerstone of the church and of this foundation. But I want to spend just a little bit more time on that today before we make a second key point in this series. You see, I have this fear today when we look at the religious world and even when we look in the church today, when, at times, to be honest with you, when we look in our church family today, I have this concern about what we know. Because one of the key elements of church, and yes, you want to go to a church where you, there are people that you like and people that are friendly and there's good fellowship and there's children, or my children's age, and, and all of those things like that. But church, there has to be something underneath the hood that is deeper than just what's apparent on the outside. I've listed some scriptures for you this morning because I want it to be important and to see how imperative it is for us that we recognize the importance of good, solid, biblical teaching in the church. Now those are phrases that we can't deny and we can't run away from those because they're just repeated too often in scripture. When we look at the life of Jesus, and this is just a sampling of the verses that are available for us. But if you'll look at some of those that are outlined for you, Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, Jesus tells us uh, that Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. And I'll tell you this, if you want to see where Jesus was when he went into a town, to a new community, you know where you'd find him? You'd find him teaching in the synagogue. You know how I know that? Because there are at least 15 different references in the Gospels of Jesus teaching in a public area. Jesus went and Jesus taught. Now we like to talk about the good things that he did and Jesus did a lot of good things. But church, let there be no doubt that Jesus taught the good news. Let's continue looking down that list. Matthew chapter 16, verse 12. Then they understood that he was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in bread, but against the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Now church, that's difficult, and, and I, I have to confess that to you today. It's, it's difficult because there need to be times that we teach in a positive way about this is who we are supposed to be and this is what we are supposed to do. But there were times in Jesus' ministry when he stepped out and he preached against something, when he corrected the misteaching of others. And it is important that we do that as well. Now look at the response of the people in Matthew chapter 7, verses 28 and 29. It's there that Scripture tells us that the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority. You see, church, when we know those things that need to be taught, it will change of how we present that. When Jesus taught it was evident that he had authority from God. John chapter 14, verse 23, Jesus said, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. That's an important passage for us, isn't it? Because we talk about in the church today, well, you know what, Jesus, uh, Johnny, you, you know what, preacher, we just need to talk about more love. My mama would tell you that. By the way, now she's right, we're gonna get to that. It's important that we teach love, but you know what Scripture says? What did Jesus say? If you love me, you will obey my teaching. And so that's important for us to hear that as well. And then in the Great Commission, Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Church, Jesus taught. Now, it's not just that Jesus taught. Now, remember, we've talked about this. When Jesus did what? In, in the church, Jesus is described as the chief cornerstone of the church. 
But look what happened with this group of apostles that Jesus told them. He said, I want you to go and I want you to teach everything I've commanded you. And that's when we turn to the book of Acts and we see some critical things that they did there. Acts chapter 5, verse 42. It says that the apostles were devoted to teaching. And so they recognized what their mission was. In fact, do you remember? Do you remember in chapter 6, a critical need arose in the church. There were a group of widows that were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. That was a critical need in the church. And, and but what happened? What did the apostles say? And so the church comes to them and they cry out about this problem. But what was it that the apostles said? They said, we can't leave what we're doing because we're devoted to, to, to teaching and to prayer. What they were doing met a critical need in the church so much so. Jesus is the, the chief cornerstone, but Ephesians chapter 2 would describe that teaching of the apostles as a foundation for the church. And so it was critical that the truth be taught. Acts chapter 2, verse 42, that Andy read for us this morning. What did Scripture tell us? It said that that early church, those that had been baptized into Christ, after Peter's sermon at Pentecost, it said that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And so you have this great setup in the church of what has taken place. Jesus told the apostles, he said, I want you to go and I want you to baptize the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit in teaching everything I have commanded you. The apostles listened. The apostles obeyed. They were devoted to that teaching and the church was devoted to listening. They were devoted to learning. Church, that's going to be critical for us today. And I have to tell you in the church that it, it, it is so imperative for us that we have a passion for learning. And, and what, what can we say? How, how can I help it, it, it express that? It's important that we learn at home. It's important that we open our Bibles daily and that we learn at home. But it is also important for those of us who are parents, who have children in our home. Man, we teach our children everything. We teach them to make sure that they brush their teeth, they have their homework done, that they've combed their hair, and that they've done all of these things. But church, one of the most valuable things we can do is we make sure that at the end of the day that they have spent time with God. But not only have they spent time with God, but have we spent time as parents teaching them about God. And don't think that it can wait. Don't think, I remember as a youth minister that there would be parents, their children get up in the seventh grade, they'd bring them upstairs to the teen area, and they would literally hand them off to me. And they'd say, now Johnny, you make sure you teach them good. And I'd have to sit there and introduce myself to them because they had never brought their child to Sunday school before. They literally had waited until the seventh grade to start bringing their children to Sunday school. I've got to tell you, if you're waiting that point, we've got a lot of catching up to do. Because by the time we get in that class, and I do the same thing here, by the time we get in the seventh grade, I'm wanting to apply things that have already been taught. There need to be some foundational things in place. Things that have been taught in the home. Things that have been taught in our younger Sunday school classes. So parents, have your children in Sunday school. Have them in Wednesday night Bible study. There is good to be learned. But make no doubt about it, that good teaching begins at home. So we want to be devoted to that as children, as parents, but also as adults. We've got to make sure that we understand this. We will never reach a point where we know it all. Did you hear me? We will never reach a point where we know it all. We always have opportunity to learn or to be reminded of a good truth in Scripture. And so we want to make sure that we're devoted to teaching and that we're devoted to learning. Ah, but there's more. I told you I'd get back to that story about the song leader and the preacher, right? You see, it's one thing for us to talk about the importance of of being here and the good things that are supposed to happen here. But one of the things that we have to make sure is that as we come here that we understand that there, there needs to be truth taught here. 
but there is an attitude that needs to prevail in the church. There is a heart of the church that needs to become evident to all. And if we will watch carefully as we go through and read in those early chapters of Acts, we will see not only the devotion to teaching and the devotion to learning, but we will see a heart and attitude of the church that really allowed the church the opportunity to reflect Jesus Christ wherever they went. Those are some other passages we need to look at as well. Again, going back to some passages on your outline. Look at Acts chapter 2. Let's return there. Verse 46. Listen for the heart and the attitude of the church. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Can, can you just hear that? The early church enjoyed being together. It was obvious to all. They enjoyed being together. Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, Peter and John are living out the command of, of Jesus and they are teaching. And they're met with some conflict, they're met with some persecution. But even religious leaders, as they looked at Peter and John, they could tell that there was something different about them. They were plain, ordinary, unschooled men. But what was the thing they could tell? Those men had been with Jesus. And so they go through and ultimately Peter and John are released. And the great thing about it is one of the key factors in them being released is the religious leaders realized as they looked around that people all around them are giving praise to God because of the things that Peter and John had been doing. You see, church, that is an attitude. There, there's the heart of the church coming out. It's so much so that when religious leaders realize that Peter and John aren't doing things the way they want them to, they, they were, they're somewhat afraid to get involved in that because they realize that people are noticing the difference about these men. Oh, that's critical for us. Do we hear that? Now, it gets difficult because chapter 5 comes after chapter 4. Chapter 5 is not an easy topic, is it? And you've got these, these, this couple, you've got Ananias and Sapphira. And they wanted to, to give to the Lord, to the church. And so they sold this land and they gave. That's a good thing, right? They also kept some in their pocket. Now best I can figure out out of that deal is they wanted an appearance to be good, but... Peter was able to check under the hood and he recognized that there was corruption there. And you see, one of the most difficult things, because when we start talking about the heart and the attitude of the church, we want to think smiles, we want to think fellowship, we want to think joy, and, and man, I, I want to do that. I want us to enjoy being together. But what was the first part of our lesson? where we have a passion for teaching and a passion for learning. And you see, church, we've got to have a love for the Lord and a love for His teaching, this love for the truth that supersedes this other. And so whenever Ananias and Sapphira were caught in sinful actions, Peter was not afraid, he was not embarrassed, he was willing to confront that sin. Now you sit there and go, boy, Johnny, that's pouring cold water. No, it's not. Because you see, whenever we allow a sin to plant its seed in the church family, I can promise you that all of this desire of wanting to have glad and sincere hearts and fellowship with one another, if we let sin plant its seed and grow and nurture in the church, I'm telling you, bad days are ahead. And maybe one of the things of my generation that we have, that we're going to look back on this and things that wish that we wish that we had done this earlier. 
is we wish that we had taken a loving but firm stand against sin. That we had been willing to love brothers and sisters in Christ enough to confront sin as Scripture confronts it. Now you got to hear what I said. We lovingly confront it because even Paul said that we can teach and speak the truth in love. And it doesn't do us much good if we were sitting here and we want to confront it. But in our anger in confronting that, we do more harm than good. Now, I've got to tell you, again, that story in Acts chapter 5, that didn't quite turn out the way that we would want that to, did we? But we've got to be willing to confront sin, church. All right, Acts chapter 6. Talked about this just a little bit earlier. We talked about the fact that there was a need there, and I love the way that this is resolved. I love the fact that there were people that were willing to stand up, and they didn't sit in a corner and get their feelings hurt. They didn't sit here and not say anything. They spoke up, and they said, Whoa! Hey! Y'all are handing it. What happened? And there was a need. There was a need that was made apparent to the church. And the church responded to that. And so the way they fixed that is they got the preacher to take care of it, right? No, they didn't. Church, I need you to go back and I need you to read those first seven verses of Acts chapter 6 very carefully. Because the way that problem got resolved is that the church resolved the problem. You see, that's where we respond as a church family. Why is it because we're going to sit here and finger point about whose job it is to do it? No, we just want to make sure it gets resolved. Well, we wanted to make sure in that case there were people that were hungry. You know what? You didn't have a lot of days to sit here and try to work that out. If they're hungry, what do they need? Food. And we don't have time to put together a committee of that. We don't have time to wait and to call a meeting over that. We need to sit there and resolve it and let's move on. Because you see, that's the heart of the church. The heart of the church is when you look at that and you see the problem and we ask this, how can I help be part of the answer? That's the heart of the church. All right, I need to put some of these things together. I think there are five blanks. I want to give you five words. They all start with C, so here we go. That when we look at these stories and we put that together, what are some things just practically we can take with us today? First of all, church, we need to have conviction. We need to have a heart of conviction. That's where we have listened, we have learned, we have studied, and we have conviction about the things we believe. We also have to have a spirit of confrontation that when it is necessary and there's sin in the midst that we're willing to confront that and willing to try to address it and to move on. We also, third of all though, we need to have a spirit of celebration. Now I'm moving through these things quickly but I want to stop just a minute because I'm not saying that we've got any of these things down pat. Church, we need to know what we believe. We need to be willing to lovingly confront sin that stands in between a believer and a right relationship with God. That sin that threatens to to taint the church and our overall effectiveness in trying to share the gospel with the community. But we also need to be willing to celebrate. When we come together and and we pick out, uh, Steve or Danny picks out a song and it deals with the resurrection of our Lord, We celebrate the fact that we come together today. Man, I'm so thankful that Jesus loved us enough to come to earth, to live among us, and to die for us. But church, let there be no doubt on that Sunday morning that the tomb was found empty. And we celebrate that. When there's a new brother or sister born into Christ, we celebrate that. When there is reason to rejoice in our church family, we rejoice with one another. And we need to learn to do that and to celebrate the fact that we are family and we come together and we have that with Jesus Christ as head of the church and we are his body and we're working together for the good and the glory of God. And when there's reason to celebrate, we want to make sure that we do that.
Now we're going to get to the song leader and the preacher. It's a spirit of cooperation. It's a spirit of unity where we work together for the good of the Lord. You see, ultimately when all of this thing is said and done, and can I just tell you this? I, I love what I do. But I am humbled every Sunday at the opportunity to get to do what I do. It is an honor to proclaim the gospel and to open scripture before this church family. It's also an honor to work with you in various aspects of ministry. And I think you've gotten to see that. You've gotten to see, and I love this, I call them only God moments. When we look at Vacation Bible School, and I believe the count was there were over 40 teens and adults that were helping with Vacation Bible School. Can't look at a single person without recognizing that every person was important for the success of that effort. When we look at our pantry and of how many people are involved in that or other ministries of the church, there's no one that stands above and more important than the other because we work together in a spirit of cooperation and unity. And that's when we look at that and we say, only God can do such good things in such moments. And it's an honor to be a part of that. So if we take these and put them together, if we look and we have this spirit of conviction, but we know we have to be willing to confront, we know we want to celebrate, and we cooperate with one another, what, what does it boil down to? Is there one word at the end that I could give us that would help us just take that and move on from here? And, and, and I hope that I've chosen the right word. But it's the word commitment. It's a commitment to the Lord where we come and we recognize Jesus is Lord. And when we come to Him and we confess that name and we're baptized for the forgiveness of our sins, but it's not just that we're committed to the Lord, now we're committed to His cause. We're committed to working together for the good of what can happen in the gospel being shared in this community. It's a commitment to God, it's a commitment to the Lord, and it's a commitment to the effort in the church. Oh, friends, we've got to have a commitment to the church. We've got, to, we've got to love the church and of what we stand for and what we have opportunity to do. We've got to be committed to one another to realize that we have some responsibility among one another. Man, what a great effort. And, and it's more than this, okay? It's more than the fact that if, you've, if you're sick that I'm carrying you a casserole. Now, that, that's a good thing to do. All right? Keep that in mind. But man, when we start talking about being committed to one another, here's, here's that ultimate commitment. That I want to make sure if we're going to sit next to one another every Sunday, I want to make sure that we've got a spot next to one another in heaven. I want to make sure that you're there. And I hope that you want to make sure that I'm there. That's the commitment because it's a commitment that we look ahead for all eternity. Then we want to make sure that we come to know Christ, but we want to make sure that we grow in Christ. And so church, let's have a commitment to that. You see, now we've talked about taking the truth that was taught by Jesus, the truth that the apostles took that and they laid that foundation. And now we're talking about taking that, sharing it with one another, but living it out among one another. Now don't you want to be a part of a church like that? That's a church that's described in Scripture. There now we're going back to God's blueprint, His plan for the church. We close this morning with a psalm that Steve selected. And if it's your desire this morning to come to Christ and to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins, or if you have a desire for the seek the prayers of this church family, we'd love to pray with you and pray for you. But if we can help you in any way, come now, let's stand and let's sing.